thank you. Um, I love it, Sylvestra. I think I may start adopting it. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I'm Mel Sylvest. Um, and I guess, yeah, as a first disclaimer, uh, English is not my first language, although I am from Canada. Uh, I'm originally from Quebec, so if I say funny thing, this is not the way that all Canadians speak. It is the way that Mel speak, uh, which has been also kind of influenced now from having been in BC for 10 years. So I have this weird accent that nobody can reproduce now to make it really unique. Uh, so yeah, I'm here to talk about uh, scaling up uh, as a co-op mainly. Um, to do so, what I was thinking would be the best way is just to tell you, tell you my story and then tell you along with that, the story of the BC Ecosy Co-op. And I acknowledge that this is just one story. Uh, it's not a recipe, and I can assure you it's not a recipe. You do not want to repeat it. Um, you could probably do better. Uh, you could probably do worse, hopefully, because otherwise that will make me the worse. Um, but just I thought I'd just sharing the story might hopefully uh, inspire some of you. Um, let's see. Can I work this out? Yes. So well, I've been a, an organic seed, uh, not an organic seed producer, but an organic producer for about 12 years, uh, and an organic uh, seed producer for about now seven years. Uh, I started, um, well, I have different starts in my life, but around in 2011, I moved to a farm called UBC Farm, which is located in Vancouver, uh, British Columbia. And at UBC Farm, to give you an, an overview of it, if you're interested about UBC Farm, we can talk another time. I, I don't have time to go in that. It will be a presentation in itself. But we do a lot of research, we do a lot of education, and we do community engagement. But mainly also what we do is actually, it's a production farm. It's an organic production farm. Uh, a piece of it, when I, when I got at UBC Farm, um, and I was already a seed producer back then, I already started getting my hands around saving seeds. One thing I, I noticed right away is that there was not there was not much seed saving happening and I was like, well, sweet, here's my, my little niche to go in, or should I say niche? I've, I've been hearing people say niche. Is that niche? It's the same thing, right? Okay, well, both depend where you're from. Okay, well, keep with niche. Um, so, so yeah, I, I saw this, this opportunity for me to keep playing around with seeds. It's basically feeding my seed addiction, as I call it. Um, so I started playing around and, and quite quickly, like it became obvious that um, there, there was definitely a need for it and like people were getting really excited about seed around. So it became also like a, a nice piece to do education, having a lot of students coming through the farm every year where a farm that's open for the general public too, but a lot of students also engage at UBC come through. So there was a lot of like curiosity around it. Some people from courses started coming, so we started doing education. I always had in the back of my head that it would be great to do research, but now we're starting doing a little bit more. Obviously, obviously, I always have my little research project going on my own, like the farmer type of research, you know, and like comparing things like, oh yeah, that's better. But there's just so much, you know, so far you can go in. And being within UBC, I was like, well, it would be so great to have a bit more support from, from faculty to do that. So I'm really happy actually this is starting now. Uh, and that's another thing we can talk about outside of this presentation. But so this is kind of what's been happening uh, for me right now since 2011, working around that. So now the piece I want to bring in is um, at UBC Farm, the seed I grow, where does that go? Well, I have a very, like, multiple ways I select uh, the crops that I grow. Like, obviously, one thing is like, well, are we going to use it in our field? Which is really my main, the most important things for me, uh, because I also allow me how it does afterwards. So, um, but another piece of this, and I guess now we're going to go back in time, is like. I didn't want to start a new seed company that put the seed in packets. And this is kind of the reason why. This is BC. This is a subset of BC seed retail company that do seed packets. Uh, if you look on the map, BC is quite a large province, but we're all at the bottom of it. Like there's barely nobody. So that, this is a lot of seed packets company in one province. And I have nothing against gardeners. Like, believe me, I love gardeners. I, I am not one myself. Actually, I'm not horrible gardeners. I'm way better farmer. Um, but those seed packets goes to gardener, right? Or a lot of them. As a farmer, I realized this a few years in. At one point, I realized, well, A, that my seeds were not necessarily coming from the region I was in. I was starting learning about adaptation and things like that. 
met a seed producer that, that, that was producing a little bit of seeds on the side. And I was like, hey, I want to grow your seed. And when I started calculating how many seed packets I had to buy for feeding like my 200 feet row, which was probably something like 11 of them, and realized the economy wasn't quite there for me. So I was like, what? I cannot buy, like I cannot buy the seeds that are grown here for my farm. As a, like I, it just kind of really shook me back then. So that was kind of became my kind of like, well, I'll grow, I'll grow them myself then. I'll, I can do this. I figure out how to grow food. I can figure out how to grow seeds, right? So that was kind of my journey there and the reason why. And also the fact that like, and the matter is that I could start a new seed packet company. And I actually, the reality is like I had to start like the UBC farm seed logo there did came from the fact that I was sitting on a lot of seeds and I didn't have anywhere to send them. Um, but yeah, so maybe continuing on that. Um, so when I started the project with the intentions, like I will grow seed, I will grow seed for the farm and I will grow seed for the farmer. Great idea. And I tend to do those kind of things. I have a great idea, I move forward with it, but I forgot about the de some of the details along the way. And one of the details is that after the first season of growing my seed, I had a lot of seeds. Now, how do I get them to farmers? You would think like, duh, you should have thought about that before, right? Well, I didn't in my case because I was—I have my cushy paper hour also farming job, so it allowed me to not really think about that. I guess that's where it's from. But the reality is like, well, okay, well, I need to get them in the end of farmers. So I put the word out there. I sent an email, list served, but obviously nobody really responded. I was offering like, what, 12 crops? Like, they didn't bother like looking through my list. And who am I anyway? Can they trust me? Like, what's the quality of my seeds? So at the same time that this was happening, I met a lot of people in the community in BC. There's a lot, like you can see, that's just a subset of the seed coming we have. There's a lot of seed growers. There's a lot of people who are passionate about seed. There was this um, kind of collective, like a lot of, um, how do we call that? An idea that was coming from a, another NGO called BC Seed that had gathered people and uh, offered some workshop and support. And they had a little group talking, and I realized that this conversation has happened in the community before. It's not the first time we start talking about collaborating between farmers. And that was my thought at this point. It's like, well, what about we get together to sell receipts? I'm not going to be good to, to produce like 80 crops at a scale in which I can sell the farmer. But if I do five, and another one do five, or even two, or three, or one thing, maybe all together we can have a decent catalog. And we have obviously a lot of experience around. So after many years of chatting about it and talking about it, the BC Kusi Co-op was born out of this idea. Uh, it wasn't that easy actually, but we made it happen. Uh, and thanks for the support also from some people that donated a lot of time and also some grant money that came through that really helped us getting off the ground. So it's a producer run cooperative. Uh, to start with, so the members are producer themselves, and we well we officially got incorporated in 2014, in November 2014. So throughout 2015, we've just been working really hard at putting the building blocks of what the co-op's going to look like. Um, but here, well, right, I'm going to show you the other one. So those are the lovely people I get to, or a lot of them that I get to uh, work with. Um, and I'm so thankful, like in, I would say even just in this photo, if we add up all the experience and years experience, we're over 100 years of experience of growing seed in BC. So I feel like nobody beside them sometime with my seven years adding them to the, so it's an incredible uh, advantage, I guess, for me to be working with them. Um, but the one thing that I have to be really specific about as we keep moving on this, what's, what makes BC Kusi Co-op unique uh, is that we have decided between all members that we will not do seed packets. And the main reason why is that slides before, a lot of those members with us already have their seed packet business. What we're trying to achieve together and what we all agree to achieve together is that we want to get our seeds in the hands of farmers. So knowing this now, what I'll do is I'll just go through a few, like what I picked up as the success or advantages of working together uh, towards building the seed security in our province and beyond, and some of the challenges, and uh, yeah. So some of the success um, that 
I picked up my, and, and I would love if there's other co-op member in the room afterwards, I want to share also their vision of it. Uh, I'm sure there's more, there's more things to be talked about. But really, one big opportunity for, and that's part of my story, the piece of my story in that is like, I can be a seed producer without having to create my own little seed packet companies. And for those of you that were in the, one of the first workshop uh, that Steve Peter was part of, um, that was really well laid out of like, what is the effort of putting in into a seed retail packet company versus contract growing and all that. It's a lot of effort and I had, I did that right from the beginning for myself. This is not what I wanted to do. So that allowed farmers and not only seed producer, that allowed also other farmers right now that maybe were interested in growing seeds, but do not want to get into growing 10 and 15 and 20 crops, but maybe they, they could be the best one in their region of growing those crops to now jumping on board and just growing that one crop and get really good at it. And then, well, the second, maybe not the second advantage here, but another advantage we have is like, because we have this group of people working together, even if you've never grown this crop, you really have that bank of knowledge to that come along with it. And quite likely there will be someone in the region that's done it before and can support you through it. So the other advantage, and that comes more from, I think, the people that had seed retail company and they have small packets company, with the minimum population that sometimes you have to hit, the amount of seeds that you're producing is beyond what you can carry in your seed retail company. So that allowed a new outlet for those seed company to have like, okay, I will package my whatever, 500 packets of this one crop and then the rest can go to the co-op. So that's one extra outlet for them that could be advantageous. And then there's all the, the, the opportunity that comes with it in terms of sharing. When a province, anybody that visited BC, if you cross in a way the province, you can see like we go from the ocean into the really, really hot and dry area and then into the mountains. So we have all the advantage of that too, that we can start and, and definitely something we need to, to work on. But if we were to get a growers in each of those regions, we can really start specializing too in crops. Like on the coast, I can grow tomatoes, but I can definitely not grow as many tomato seeds or my, my yield will be way lower than someone that's in the hotter region. So really start looking into those environmentally advantage, uh, environmental advantage. And then there's choosing a crop based on technology. We, there's a, been a lot of talk about the different technology that we can have around, but we cannot have access to all of them. So maybe I could select a crop even based on knowing that someone in my region has this really good cleaner that if I just was to swing by and clean my seed in two hours instead of doing by hand for 10 hours. So that could influence me and then the knowledge available around in my region could uh, influence my decision. And then there's the and the other advantage, infrastructure sharing. Um, equipment, it's something we're looking towards to probably start building up that capacity between us. Right now, what we have is what we have, and it's a bit harder to share. Uh, the distance that separates some of our members, like 12-hour drive, it was actually quicker for me to come down here than to visit another member. Um, but definitely the marketing and sell piece of it makes it way easier that we don't have to all go through this, but we can share that infrastructure of sales and marketing. This has really been great. Uh, the collective knowledge I already mentioned, like everything that we shared together, and that to have created a space to discuss how to build all those building blocks, there's all those little pieces of knowledge that come through. Because obviously when you get on the phone and it's 8 o'clock at night, if you've been working on your crop, you've been like, I don't know what's happening, but this crop is just not germinating right now. And then you'll have someone that's been working with it for 25 years, like, oh, have you tried this? I was like, thanks. And of course I could have sent an email and I could have called, but we know that our time restriction sometimes comes into play and you think about calling someone, you're in the middle of the field, but this space, that like one hour meeting that we have once in a while, so will sometimes just like have genius idea coming through and it's, it's been really valuable. Um, some of the other things, like the mentorship opportunity, is something we actually can work on it right now on how can we get more producer on board. Um, definitely that we'll need to work around a little bit, but I think that will be a great advantage for us. And then the, the promotional, like back and forth between the seed company. So I, when we set our seed, we always say what, which farm it's from. So if one of the seeds is carried by full circle seed, here we go, they have one other promotional, like items there and, and the fact that we sell or see just in larger quantities, if there's a gardener that comes through, but I don't want as much of it, then they can just click on full circle seeds and they get shipped to their website, which they can buy smaller quantities. So that can really become advantageous in the long run. 
that sense. And obviously, there's challenges. Um, I think I only put, no, there is two pages of challenges. It could have probably be more. Um, I probably restricted myself to two pages. Uh, pricing was one of actually really interesting and mind-boggling uh, piece that that we worked through. Um, and I won't go through all details, the details of how we try to do it, but all the members are in the room are probably kind of like, yeah. It was, yeah, it was kind of tedious, and I'm not sure we're doing it right, and that's a conversation I would love to have with some of you that are doing bulk pricing. Uh, but I feel like the, what is that story, the giant goal yet in uh, anyway, the battle with the giant, like I feel I'm competing with the combine right now really for my pricing, which is making it really challenging. I want to offer basically my seat. Uh, well, I want to be paid a decent wage for the work I'm doing, and uh, I don't want the farmer to have to be the person that has to pay the higher price too. So we want to we wanted to just create this kind of, okay, well, I want to sell my seat to farmer, but if that seat is available like at a fifth of the price through a distributor, no matter if it's locally adapted or not, at one point you do have restrictions as a farmer. And as a farmer myself, I know that. So now it's this game that we're playing, being like, well, I want to pay myself a decent wage, but I do not want to charge because this is my friend. So you can see the storyline here. Like it gets really complicated, and I think we really need to work uh, harder to find our own system and also talk to other people that have done it. Um, because I think it's we're unique in BC, but I know we're not unique in the world trying to do this right now. And then in defining the scale, uh, the right dis distribution scale, and, and obviously for those of you who are doing seed at retails and uh, at packets and doing seed in larger quantity, you know you're, the highest profit margin is really at the packet size. So now no, we kind of kicked out that opportunity <laughs> of the co-op uh, to, to be able to not to compete with each other. But now we have to find what is the right scale for us and what is those quantity that are needed for farmers. Like what is the smallest that we can package that we're still addressing farmers need. And again, the pricing coming into this. So, and then there is the defining the, the, the right market for it. Obviously they're talking to the farming community about all of this. Um, trying to find out what, does farmer, what are our farmer wants really. Like, we're all, and that's what's been interesting, all our members are also farmers, so we talk to each other and we're like, yeah, I really like this piece, but we all know also between farmers, we all like different things. That's why seed catalogs have, who knows how many hundreds of varieties in them, because we're all odd fellows and we want different things. So really identifying in our region, what do we want and how do we get that information right now? And that's definitely been a challenge, I think, for the first year, when we went off like, okay, what are you good at growing and just grow it? Now we're kind of like, okay, we do not have actually carrots in our catalog. Well, we know farmers want carrots. So how do, how do, we, do we figure this one out? Um, and I'll move on just to make it a bit quicker. Uh, yeah, so those are the other conversations that came up, agreeing on best practices and really being able to offer quality seeds. All of our growers have grown seeds before, have packaged seeds before, but now we know we're in the different... Uh, arena, like we're in a different zone and quality is, has a complete different meaning uh, for a gardener and a farmer and we know as farmers. So how do we define this? How do we record this? How do we talk about this as a co-op? And defining this has been a big part of our discussion in the first year. I think we did a pretty good job at it right now, but it's, uh, it's pretty tedious uh, in working as a co-op. And then the ecologically grow versus organically grow, actually in our case we have a few producers that are not certified organic and that's a piece of reality also of being in British Columbia on the coast as the land is so expensive, a lot of farmers cannot afford land so you end up having to move quite often and sometimes you may lose your certification through this. We do not want to alienate those farmers and kick them out just before they got kicked out of their land and want to keep getting them on board and keeping them on board. So that, how do we offer a sense, a sense of security to for our customers that we're carrying both and we can do it right. And we're also accepting just people that know those practice well. And then the challenge of geographical distances, uh, we meet over the phone. It will be great to meet in person, but we cannot afford that in time and in, in money. Um, and then the summer, I guess, <laughs> is the other challenges comes around like April, May, really hard to get people to reply to email. It's really hard to get people to reply to email 12 months of the year, but the May to September is just a, a true challenge that we really need to address as a co-op. 
And then the next step and, and some of the lesson, uh, I guess I won't go through the list. I think it's, um, it's pretty obvious. Pretty much everything I talked about, there's a little bit more work to be done on. Uh, definitely more crop planning and marketing planning and, and all of this. But overall, like I think, and more and more as I actually spend time at this conference, I've noticed so many other co-op that have been popping in recent years. It's really inspiring, and I'm really looking forward to to learn from other people. But um, yeah, I'll leave it there for now. Thanks. <laughs>